Well, in this series, we've been talking about prayer. So far, we've talked about how prayer is an open door to be close to God. Prayer is an open door to ask God. And prayer is an open door to need God. Well, today I want to wrap up this series by talking about something that has the potential to block or prevent us from praying. It's something that can creep up on all of us if we're not careful, and it can show up without us even noticing. And it's one simple word. Cynicism. Now, I used to work with a guy who was extremely negative and pessimistic, like the worst, right? Every time I had an idea, he would tell me all the reasons why it wouldn't work. He would say, well, I'm just being realistic. And I would think, no, you're actually being a total downer. Now, incidentally, God used that coworker to do a lot of work on my character and my attitude. But I wonder if that's how we approach prayer sometimes. Or is it possible that's why some of us don't pray at all? And we're tempted to be cynical and pessimistic and negative. We think of all the reasons why prayer won't work. We tried before and it didn't work. We don't use the right words. Our heart isn't in the right place. We don't think that God will change us. We don't think that God will change the people around us. We don't think that God will answer our prayers. And one time I spoke at a student church retreat and the student pastor wanted me to talk about praying big prayers and asking God to do big things. In fact, we coordinated a time after the sessions for the students to scatter all around campus and spend time praying big prayers. Well, while the students were out, the student pastor came to me and he asked, do you think we're setting them up for disappointment? I mean, you just preached about asking God for big things. Some of these students may be praying for the first time. So what's gonna happen if they don't get what they ask for? And to be honest with you, I had no answer. In fact, that question haunted me for the next few days. And I realized that I didn't practice what I preached. Without realizing it, an underlying cynicism had formed in my heart. And I no longer prayed big prayers because I didn't believe that they would be answered. So one of my first big prayers was for God to give me back my passion. Why? Because passion is one of the first things that goes when we become cynical about prayer. We, we check out. We become passive. We go through the motions. We become numb or we simply just stop praying altogether. And what we don't realize is that while we're trying to protect ourselves from crushing disappointment, we're actually preventing ourselves from being hopeful. To be cynical is to be distant from hope and detached from passion that's the cost of being cynical. Now the truth is for most of us, we want to control things. And prayer is simply something that we can't control. We can't guarantee that we'll get what we want. We can't force God to do what we ask, but guess what? We can't control other people and outcomes either, can we? So as much as we clamor to hold on to and control any area of our lives, we never really have it. So the question is this, if cynicism shuts the door to prayer, what can open it back up? The challenge with prayer is that there's not really a way to explain how it works. There's no formula or equation for how to pray. God isn't a vending machine, and if you look at prayers throughout the Bible for an example of how to pray, it won't necessarily get clearer for you. The way people talked to God spanned a range of styles and emotions. In the Old Testament, King David wrote many songs and poems. They were written as communication with God, which is essentially what prayer is. This is what David sang in Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. David didn't claim to be able to do things in his own strength, nor did he claim to be able to figure things out on his own, but instead he was content like a child with his mother. He didn't have control, but he had trust. And that's what made his relationship with God so close and intimate. And the same is true with people. The best relationships in the world are always based on trust. Children trust that their mother will take good care of them. They know she loves them. They aren't cynical, wondering if mom is gonna come through for them. And when we pray, we give up our freedom 
and our independence. We yield our need for control, and in return, we gain a closeness with God, like a mother and her child. The things that activate that closeness are dependency and trust. And many years later, the Apostle Paul wrote this, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from Him and through Him and for Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. See, Paul understood that God's knowledge is beyond what human beings can understand. And like David, he didn't concern himself with things that were beyond his control. He trusted that God sees beyond what he can see. We can't control God, and we can't control the outcome of our prayers. All we can do is make the choice. Am I going to trust God or not? Am I going to trust the riches of his wisdom and his knowledge? If prayer meant that we got whatever we asked for, we wouldn't need faith. If prayer was something that we could all figure out, there'd be no mystery to it, nothing to stand in awe of. If we could fix everything on our own, we wouldn't need God. We don't know what God will do, but we can have faith in what God can do. Think of it this way. Prayer is an open door to trust God. Trust is what great relationships are all about. And prayer is all about a relationship with God. But trust doesn't mean that we're not honest. Trust doesn't mean that we don't have doubt. Trust doesn't mean that it's all puppies and roses and we never feel hurt or fear. Let's look at a song by David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. There is nothing passive about this prayer. Yes, David trusted God. He even said, I trust in your unfailing love. But he also honestly expressed his doubts. It's like he, he wrestled with God through this whole prayer. Sometimes it's easy for us to question if God is loving or if he's willing to help us. But instead of engaging with God the way David did, we check out and become passive. We choose to feel nothing instead of staying passionately engaged. God's not put off by our questions or our fears or our doubts. He is completely aware of our circumstances and he sees what we can't see. Will we give up on the struggle and check out? Or will we be willing to stay in the mix with God? Now, as we get ready to close this series, I wanna encourage you to take a few steps. First, look for the ways that God has been good to you. Instead of looking only at the things that didn't work out the way you hoped, begin looking for the good things. Prayers that God did answer. Ways that he's moving in your life and the lives of people around you through prayer and gifts and blessings that he's offered to you. Begin to ask God to give you hope and help you see more with eyes of faith. Hope isn't found in an outcome, it's found in the person of Jesus. The more you and I look for Jesus, the more our trust will be developed. The Apostle Paul wrote this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Start praying daily about the things that make you feel cynical and ask God to breathe hope into you by the power of His Holy Spirit. Here's the second thing, keep praying. Think about the difference between becoming passive and becoming proactive in your prayer life. The difference between checking out and staying in the mix. Imagine where you'll be in 10 years if you remain passive and checked out. Imagine what you'll miss. Answered prayers, unexpected blessings, and 10 years of wrestling with God in prayer. Now, 
Imagine where you'll be in 10 years if you stay in the mix. If you keep bringing as much trust and honesty as you can to an active prayer life. If you step into this mysterious journey, how rich could your relationship with God be 10 years from now? Don't demand that the story go your way and don't give up, just stay engaged in your relationship with God. And the more we do that, the more a trust will be developed. Third, pray for other people. God can change the people around you. And in the midst of you praying for them, he'll actually change you. Over time, you'll start noticing the prayers that have been answered and that will build your trust. You'll experience a change in you and that will build your trust as well. And if it helps, keep a journal or a note in your phone of some people and circumstances you're praying for. One day, you'll discover that this journal or note app has diminished your cynicism. C.S. Lewis, uh, who's a famous Christian writer, wrote this. Those who will never be fooled can never be delighted. If you're cynical, maybe you can guard against being fooled, but you won't be delighted. We can't control things. We can't figure everything out, and we certainly can't make it happen in our own strength. Prayer is an open door to trust God. It's an invitation to be honest and proactive and engaged and passionate in a prayer life that doesn't always make sense. It's a mysterious journey with a God who sees what we can't see. But over time, this journey becomes a delightful one, a journey that we'll never regret. God wants a relationship with you, and prayer is a beautiful door for you to walk right through.